All right, I'm going to pull you back. I'm going to pull you back. What were some of the things that you guys said? What are specific DTX cultural influences right now? Robin's group. What are some things that y'all talked about? Uh, private schools. Private it's schools. Such a big deal. Like, can you, can you start feeding into whatever good school is going to feed into a great private school when they're six months old? Yeah, that's really good. So, if you think of the ancient city of Pompeii, after Vesuvius erupts, it freezes in time. And so now that we've archaeologically been able to dig out so much, we learn a lot about what life was like in that period. And so they, you know, architecture, dwellings, homes, you know, the way people worked, all that stuff. If Dallas had that equivalent, it would be odd that we have tutoring companies for fifth graders. But we have them because that helps them get into the right middle school, which then helps them because there are certain tests you have to take to get into private school. Did y'all know that? So there are people that just test prep fifth graders. Yes. So I think, yeah, really great answer. What else do y'all talk about that's really unique to DTX? Or is it just? Well, that's not unique to DTX. Yeah, I mean, true. But, but it's unique to a big city, right? So if you go to uh, or an, uh, an affluent city. So in my city, the hood, we didn't have private schools. Nobody went to private schools. Um, and when we played them in sports, depending on the sport, we beat up on them, and, and because if it was a sport that required money, they beat up on us. But if it was a sport that required grit and physical contact, we did okay. So these are things that you kind of know in your world that if 2,000 years from now you go, this is interesting that this city has centers for learning for little children, and this city has no center for learning for little, right, however the archaeologists would say it. What other influences? Obviously the Cowboys loom large. Sure, yeah, yeah, which if you think of, so in the ancient world, Athens is the epicenter for uh, Olympic Games, but the second one is Corinth. So when Paul writes to Corinth, it's no wonder he uses a sport metaphor. That it's the second largest Olympics in the ancient world. That's why he's not using that metaphor with Ephesus. What else? Well, we also just talked about the, I mean, affluence, so Kelsey was saying Botox and the latest cars and all of, you know. Yeah, it's good, it's good. Yeah. Julie brought up, well, the, especially Dallas, specifically the conversations around like racism and yep. kind of bringing all of that within city. Yeah, why does this neighbor have sidewalks and lights and this one didn't? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why is the response time for the ambulance this one 30 seconds and this one? Like, I remember moving to Oak Cliff and people were like, oh, we got an offender bender and we called the cops and we're waiting for them to come. I was like, Did you get their info? Yeah, go home. No, no, that's what you're supposed to do. They ain't coming. Did you say shots fired? No. They ain't coming. Yeah, OK, so you guys are understanding. So we sort of intuit these things when you're in it, right? You don't tend to have to explain Dallas to Dallasites. You only have to explain. Da like today, my mom was like, hey, a friend of mine's coming to Dallas this week. Do you have any uh, restaurant recommendations? And I was like, well, like where? And she's like, I don't know, just give me some general recommendations. So I did. And then later, I was like, ask her where? Because she's coming down for some medical tests. And I was like, I don't want to make this difficult on her mom. I'd really like to serve your friend in this way. And then she writes back, Frisco. I was like, those are a 1,000 miles apart. <laughs> I don't go to Oklahoma, mother. So I don't know. Um, and then she was like, she's planning to go to the farmer's market. I was like, Frisco or Dallas? She's like, Dallas. I was like, I bet she won't. But that's all right. <laughs> So these same influences that we understand are the same influences that if you understand what's going on in the world of the text, any text you're trying to understand, it will help you. And so that's why we always, anytime we're doing a book of the Bible, we, we take our time on the first week to really get behind the who, what, when, where, and why to help us say, okay, why were these choices made when Paul wrote to Timothy? Um, and so I'm getting ahead of myself because that's the who. So let's jump in, the who. Obviously, the, the very simple thing is it's Tim, right? It's got his name on it. And then it's from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, all of that, to Timothy, my son in the faith. So these are the who's. Um, one thing, there, I, how many of y'all have heard like people talking about disputed letters of Paul? Maybe Paul wrote it, maybe Paul didn't. Okay, these are the pastoral letters, First and Second Timothy and, and Titus, are highly debated as to whether or not Paul wrote them. Okay, so I just want to address that before we get going. So there's kind of three main arguments as to why Paul didn't write it. 
Um, so I'm just going to tell you now. I think he did, but I want to give you this now because you might, if you're reading up on it, you'll hear people say the author of First Timothy or, you know, Paul in quotations or however uh, they want to put the author in there. So some people say, well, it doesn't sound like him. There's a linguistic problem here. Um, others say the chronology is wonky in the letters compared to Acts. So in the book of Acts, the way that Paul moves in and through Ephesus and the way that Paul says he it moved in and through Ephesus don't always line up. Um, and then it's got some higher church ecclesiology. And what they mean by that is when the churches were first planted, you kind of had Paul and then whatever ragtag group he could find. And it wasn't until much later in church history that we have uh, offices like bishop, elder, deacons. And yet, the, am I not in the frame? All right, we'll do that. Who knows if it'll make it? Um, Are you going to clap? <laughs> I don't need to clap. That stuff stays. Uh, I worked out and didn't shower. got a bad hair day. Um, so some people say, oh, this is a much later letter because of those better Mar cool. uh, because of those reasons. Martin is always looking out for the way I look, if y'all didn't know. So. Um, but there's explanations for all these. So I want to teach y'all a word called amanuensis. It's a fancy word for secretary. Writers in the, old, in, the, in the first century use it all the time. So, for example, I might say, hey, Alex, can you write to Megan and tell her we're grabbing dinner on Friday night? Alex has the freedom to write, hey, dinner on Friday, we're wearing casual clothes, make sure you wear something you don't mind getting messy because we're eating ribs, right? I didn't say any of that, but she still was entrusted to give the message. So that is one way that it could have done that. Secondly, some of the language that they say doesn't sound like him, I believe, is because of... Artemis, and he's using highly uh, localized language. So how I might write to my 13-year-old niece who lives in Oklahoma about the struggles of being a 13-year-old there, and how I might write to a 13-year-old who is going to a private school in downtown Dallas, no, I know it's not maybe. I would not write the same things. And so that's part of the reason why the language is probably different. Now, the chronology, this is unfair to historians of the Bible. They are not concerned about history the way that we are. So Luke, when he's writing Acts, he's not writing untrue things, but he's not trying to get it exactly right. So uh, like I start every story with the other day. It could have been 10 years ago. And the number of times Alex would go, the other day, that was five years ago. It was not today. <laughs> it was the other day. Uh, that's how time works in a lot of places. And so like everybody knows, oh, in a minute. And you know what your friend meant by in a minute. How many of y'all know you have a friend that that meant 60 seconds? And some of y'all know you ain't seeing them. <laughs> so 40 minutes into the party, right? So yeah, so yeah, some of this chronology stuff is a little unfair to how the Bible works in general and how history works in the first century. They're not as concerned with exact dates and times the way that American history works. Um, and then this higher church ecclesiology. Paul tends to set up churches based on what they need. That's what he consistently does. The way he starts Philippi, he's like, uh, Lydia, Jewish woman, this Gentile jailer, and this demon-possessed girl, that'll work, let's go. And then in other churches, with Ephesus especially, because there's so much violence in Ephesus, he, ga he gathers a number of men he calls elders. And he's like, hey, I have to leave. Would you all protect this fledgling church? There is literal physical threats to them as opposed to Philippi where there's not. And so to me, I'm saying, ah, I think some of this is people have built an entire framework of how you have to design a church on some really flimsy stuff here. And so all this to say, I think Paul absolutely wrote this letter to Timothy. I think it's one of his last letters he's writing. He's writing as a mentor sage to this young man. Um, and maybe in Paul, a lot of people believe Paul's eyesight starts to go. That's his thorn in his side. That's why at the end of one of his letters, he's like, Let's see what large letters I write with this, right? So it could be that Timothy um, actually writes it. Paul's giving him the ideas and Tim writes it. That's one of the leading theories on maybe why it sounds different. Uh, I'm not, uh, Luke writes it for Timothy. Luke's Greek is much better than everyone else's. Luke is hoity-toity Greek. So, there's, so that could be part of why it sounds, sounds different than Paul. But I think this is a letter from Paul. For almost 1,800 years, no one questioned this. And then a bunch of Europeans were like, maybe not. So I think the burden's on them to like really prove it. But anyways, I think Paul wrote this letter to Timothy. And the people that he's talking to him about are the Ephesians. So Paul is leaving Timothy in Ephesus to care for the Ephesians. Okay? So that's the who. The what. It's a pastoral epistle. Epistle is just a fancy word for letter, so it's a pastoral letter. 
uh, somebody called them like mentoring letters, talking about the Timothys and the Titus, this idea of we don't, we don't normally get letters to individuals, right? So Paul writes to the Galatians, or he writes to the Ephesians. Um, you have Philemon, which is an interesting letter in and of itself, because it's not really written to this leader, per se, of the church, so much as you're going to do right by Onesimus. But these are really intimate letters. It's interesting that the church preserved them. And probably Tim understood, we're on a first name, nickname <laughs> basis, probably Tim understood what he was holding was significant, and circulate it among churches in the Ephesus area. Because Ephesus is not only a city, but it's going to be a region as well that they probably would have planted multiple churches in. So there's a chance Timothy is copying this and saying, hey, Bill, I know your church meets in your home. Here's what Paul told me. And now I'm telling you to do some of these same things. So he's passing the baton to Timothy and Titus. Paul knows. I mean, he's being, if you follow Acts, he knows he's getting to the end of his life. He's getting beaten everywhere he goes. He's getting arrested. He's being thrown in a Roman jail. I mean, this guy is not unaware that his time is coming short. And so it's a really sweet thing that we have these letters preserved for us. Um, You don't normally have a ton of personal mail preserved 2,000 years. Very, very little mail preserved for 2,000 years. Okay, the win. Let's go on a journey. So in Acts 16, Paul grabs Tim. Tim is a special guy. He has parents of different ethnicities. And he's not currently circumcised when Paul grabs him. Now, this is interesting because Paul's the guy who, in Galatia, when there were Jewish people coming in and telling the Galatian Christians, who are very, very Gentile, in order to be among this new Jesus movement, you have to get circumcised. Now, imagine walking into a place where people have just converted to Christianity. It's the ancient world. You don't have hospitals. You don't have anesthesia. And you're like, you have to get circumcised, grown man. Fellas, are you really thinking that's a, like... Yeah, sure, no big deal on a Tuesday. Yeah, thumbs down from Carter, right. (laughs) So Paul's response in the Greek is closer to, why don't you just tell him to cut the whole thing off? (laughs) Ew. Uh, So then he says to the Galatians, who bewitched you? Do you not remember what I told you? You don't know how to do that? Okay, that's probably good news for them. I wouldn't, you know. It's interesting, though, that Paul says to Timothy, hey, man, if you're going to come with me, we're going to go into synagogues and we're going to try and convert the Jewish believers in every, or Jewish people in every city we go into. And they're not going to take you serious if you're not circumcised. And so even though Paul's commitment to the gospel is to place no hindrances, his commitment as a missionary is to himself not be a hindrance and to not let Timothy be a hindrance. And think about what Timothy agrees to here. This is like more than just, hey, do you want to go on a mission trip to Mexico for a week? We'll paint buildings for three days, and then we'll go to the beach for three days, and you all will talk about how it changed your life, right? This is different level of commitment that Timothy's agreeing to here. So after he grabs him, they go to a couple of cities, Galatia, all that, great. They go to Philippi, like I said, really cool story of Lydia and the Gentile jailer and all that. Then they go to Thessalonica. And you can imagine Timothy at this point, it's like, neat, we tried to start uh, in the, they go to Philippi, and they're looking for the synagogue, and there is no synagogue, so then they meet Lydia, and they start this church. And the only issue they really have in Philippi is the demon-possessed girl is walking behind them, yelling at them. And then Paul gets perturbed. He's like, I've had enough, and he exercises the demon, okay? And then the, the jailer, they get thrown in jail, right? But So there's sort of like, you can see Timothy is seeing the ratcheting up of danger as he's on these trips. And then they get to Thessalonica, and now there's rioting, and they're getting run out of town, okay? So now Tim's like, man, this is, not only did I get circumcised, I'm in danger. And Paul's like, we call this Wednesday. Paul is so used to being on the run and being in danger. So they leave Thessalonica, they go to Berea, and they finally have a good moment where the Bereans are like, we're in. They study the scriptures. They said they study it vigorously every day. But then the Thessalonians were like, nah, and they came to town and ran them out of that town too. Super fun, super fun guys. So they leave there, and then they go on to Athens, uh, which is, you know, Paul's amazing story. If you were at church on Sunday, Martin talked about him going and talking at the Areopagus and all that. Then they go to Corinth. Corinth is full of buttheads, so I'm sure that was a good time for them. Go to Antioch, and then they go to Ephesus. And they try to convert the Jews in town, but they, the Jewish people weren't having it. So Paul goes to the Hall of Tyrannus, which is a hall where rhetoricians would come and just give their ideas. Wealthy people in the ancient world didn't work. That was the goal. You didn't work. If you weren't wealthy, you worked every day. There were no weekends. There were no days off. It wasn't until Constantine that he declared Sundays were off for church. And so wealthy people just sat around listening to people talk. Sounds awesome. Um, 
He went to the Hall of Tyrannus and taught there every day for two years, and he's highly effective. Okay, people are bringing him aprons, and Paul's touching it, and those people then take those faith cloths, face cloths and aprons, and they touch someone else, and they get healed just from that. Now, Paul is doing something really special in Ephesus. And we're going to talk about Artemis and how she has a stranglehold on Ephesus and why I think God gave him so much favor there. So when you're watching late night televangelists, which I have a habit of doing, I enjoy this very much, do I not? And they say to you, for $29.99, we will mail you an apron that we have prayed over. And they are referencing this. This is a real thing. Don't do it. (laughs) This is the story they're referencing. And this is a good moment to remind you, some things in Scripture are descriptive, not prescriptive, okay? So do not pay someone, unless it's me, (laughs) $29.99 for a cloth that they prayed over. But this is the story they're getting it from. So anyways, I love televangelists. y'all. I just think like, man, I would have made a killing had I gone that route. So... (laughs) Then there's this hysterical story about a Jewish exorcist. He's not a Christian. And the Jewish exorcist sees what Paul is doing. Paul is having unbelievable favor in this town. So the Jewish exorcist, by the name of Jesus, exercises a demon. And the demon comes out and he's like, hey, bro, Jesus I know and Paul I know. I don't know who you are and beats up the Jewish exorcist. These are stories in our Bible, y'all. And I just think that's hysterical, that the demon's like, you don't get to co-op Jesus. No, 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 no. And then he got beat up by this demon. It's a great story. Okay, so Paul's having unbelievable favor. I mean, Ephesian people are giving up Artemis worship, and they're coming to know Jesus, and he's preaching every day for two years in the Hall of Tyrannus, and people are getting healed. That's important. I want you to think about healing in the ancient world and what that would have communicated to them, Okay. So Demetrius, uh, so then they do a massive book burning. Normally I think book burning is bad, but this might be the one good one. Um, And then a riot breaks out, and here's why. Because Demetrius is a silversmith. And in the ancient world, there is no separation of religion and economy. There's really not today, but we try, Martin and I are trying not to sell you snake oil. That's our best effort. That's as far as we've made our vows to you all, no snake oil. That was, okay, never mind. (laughs) Y'all don't know it's a joke. It's fine. I'll sell you some snake oil. But Demetrius makes silver statues of Artemis, and they're not like kitschy little touristy things. They believe there is power in these things, and they will help you. So now imagine Paul comes to town, and he's literally taking money out of your pocket because the people that used to come by what I would call tchotchkes, but he believes actually have power of Artemis, are not buying from anywhere, and he's mad. So he starts a riot. The whole city, it says, runs to the amphitheater and starts screaming, great is Artemis. And then it says some people were yelling and didn't even know why. It was just mass hysteria. And it says it happened for two hours. And Paul says, oh, I want to go in there and talk to them. Paul's crazy. And the city officials and the the people around him are like, Paul, they're going to kill you. Do not. And they send Paul on his way. Uh, And so then Alexander is going to go talk to them, but then they realize, oh, he's the buddy of Paul, so then they keep screaming even louder. So finally, a city magistrate comes in, he's like, fellas, fellas, fellas. I have to assume it was mostly men. I'm just kidding. It was definitely full of women. Uh, And you'll understand why in a second. But people, be quiet. Hey, listen, 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 guys, guys. And he says, he just reasons with them. Who doesn't know Artemis is amazing? Like, are y'all really concerned about these little Christian movements? Like, who's going to really doubt how great Artemis is, no matter what's going on with these little Christians. He's like, listen, the courts are open. If you have a charge you want to bring against Paul, bring a charge. But otherwise, let's settle down. And what he's really worried about is he doesn't want Rome coming and settling them down. Riots in the ancient world were put out by Rome, and the way Rome puts out riots is they put people out. So he's also just trying to be a pragmatic man. He's not really helping the Christians so much as he's like, guys, we're in danger here because somebody's going to tattle on us. So the clerk gets everybody settled down, and people are like, all right, we'll go home. Now, everybody goes home. Paul has now left town. And somewhere along the way, he sends Timothy back to Ephesus. If you are Timothy, how are you feeling at that moment? Nope. I'm going to head back to Berea, where we're going to do Bible study and sing Kumbaya. I might head over to Philippi. I ain't going to Ephesus, bruh. And he's like, you go back, Timothy. And he's like, hmm. Titus gets to go to Crete. Crete still loves Artemis, but they're not, we don't have any stories of, of Crete responding that way, the same way Ephesus does. 
At some point, Paul calls a bunch of Ephesian elders to Miletus, which is a different town, and he tells them, here's your final instructions. We don't know what he says. And he sends them back, and then Paul dies in 64 CE. Unless you're reading Robin's Bible, in which case it says 67 CE, and I don't know why. I can't figure out why. I spent more time than I should have trying to figure out why. So, Well, it said he wrote, he, it said he wrote 2 Timothy in 65 CE. So there were multiple typos made. I was very upset about this. I like pulled out. I didn't. I'm, sp- I'm perturbed. That's why I'm upset. That's the real reason. If she had her own heresy Bible, I would be like, fine, you're a heretic. I didn't have anything to do with that. I bought her that Bible, and now I'm concerned, and I'm trying to figure out why it says that. So anyways, Paul dies in 64 CE, um, dies in Rome, and, um, and what's a really cool thing, if you ever want to read like Luke's story of Jesus going to die, and Luke's story of Paul going to die, they have a lot of parallels, and his point in some ways is this is the way. If you want to follow the one who's the way, you may end up on the same way, and yet it's worth it. Um, and so that's a lot of what Paul, I mean, excuse me, what Luke is doing through these books. So this letter, First Timothy, uh, I, I don't think it was probably much later than 62, 63 CE that he writes it. I don't know if the date in Acts is, you know, like when the story in Acts says he went to Ephesus and then came back, or if it's the letter, I don't know, but somewhere in there he writes that. Okay, the where. We've already talked about Ephesians. Ephesus is the city in Asia Minor. They moved the, the capital to it. The Artemisian, which is where Artemis worship is right here, was actually also a banking center. So all the wealthy people also kept their money there. This is the, like, give me New York City. Give me the big city that's like the city wherever it's at. Tell me, throw me out cities. That's like, that's cachet to be in that city. Paris. Paris, London. yeah. London. London. L.A. Yeah right? Hollywood, things like that, where you hear those cities and you go, that conjures something of wealth and influence. That's what you would have thought if you hear Ephesus. Money, 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 money. The women there, they live on the coast, and so pearls was one of the ancient resources that they would have and use, and women would just have pearls in their hair. Like slaves, slave labor was used to do wealthy women's hair. They would do these elaborate, ornate hair things, and then they would put like expensive jewels in their hair. So a woman would just be walking around wearing a bunch of wealth on her head. Not too different from like what? Give me what else? How do we display our opulence in Dallas? Purses. Purses. I learned, what was the purse? Uh, we were watching a show. Hermes? Yeah. Robin explained to me, you can't just walk into an Hermes and say, I'll buy this back. Yeah, so all the women here apparently that know something know something. You have to earn the right to even buy certain bags. And like it's a thing. Like, so in the, we we're watching suits, and so the guy's like, I'm gonna buy you an Hermes bag. And Robin goes, Oh. And I'm like, nah. And so she had to explain to me. Okay, so bags a big one. How else do we do it? display our opulence? Cars, yeah. Rings, yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's a way to say to people, I'm rich. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So think, think Ephesus. Now I want you to think. Now, when I was at Watermark Community Church, um, on Wednesday morning Bible study, there was a lot of wealth walking through that door uh, on the person. And I kept thinking of my mom, who spent most of my childhood living paycheck to paycheck, and wasn't a believer, and I kept thinking, if she walked through these doors for the first week, would she come back for the second? And my first, I I don't know if you knew this, my first uh, staff, um, like, like, evaluation, they told me I didn't dress nice enough, and I was like, you gotta help me here, like, how nice do I need to dress? And our head pastor wore jeans and t-shirts to preach, so I was very confused why I needed to dress any nicer. And at the same time that I said, can you help me understand one boss said business casual, and the other one said a dress. And I, and I looked at her, and I said, I will quit before I wear a dress. And she was like, laughed, and I go, I'm, I'm not kidding. 
And I had this moment with them that I was like, I'm not going to say it now, but I think this is a problem that the women's ministry is expected to look a certain way, but at no other ministry is anybody else expected to look a certain way. I think this is a problem. So instead of saying that, I just got really strategic. And I decided, because Watermark likes to brand everything, to create a shirt for women's Bible study specifically and encourage our leaders for the first three weeks to wear it so women would be able to say, oh, that's a leader, and I can ask her a question. And it brought the whole uh, dress code down to jeans and T-shirt. Now, you could still have your purse, you can still have your ring, but then the average woman who's not coming in with all that looks like everyone else. And by the time I left, I did my part. They were all in yoga pants <laughs> and debating whether Christian women wore yoga pants. So clearly, it was influential. But, If you want to display wealth, you can. So I want you to think about in an ancient city, not Dallas, where you, I want to be careful here, you should should not be having slaves at all in this city. And I'm going to blanket statement say no one does. I realize there's some seedy stuff that happens in cities. But think of the disparity in wealth, like even in Dallas, where you want to invite your friend who's maybe living paycheck to paycheck or is living out of her car, and then there's a woman wearing gems in her hair and you're coming together on a Sunday morning to worship. Now imagine you can take that and expand those categories even further to the wealthiest of wealthiest and her slave, who she owns, are now being called sisters and trying to collapse that together. This is part of the issue that Paul is going to be addressing in Ephesus. Is there, when he talks about modesty in this letter, he's not talking about cleavage. He probably would talk about it, but that's not the kind of modesty he's talking about. He's talking about wealth and flashing your wealth. And so Artemis is a big deal. Everybody's trying to find out who's the who's and who's and all that. It's a coastal city, um, which is going to come up even in chapter one, why he uses some of the metaphor he does. And the mythology says that the Amazon women, yes, Wonder Woman, Amazon women, built that. And when we get to what Artemis is like, you'll understand why that's the myth. So the belief was the Amazon women built that, and they are protecting it, and Artemis is protecting it. Here's Ephesus, there's Philippi, Athens, Corinth, Antioch, Caesarea, Jerusalem, all that. Has anybody been to Ephesus and seen the ruins? Okay, yeah. Amazing ancient city. Uh, what, what part of, where would Istanbul fit in comparison? I mean, I know logistically, but like status-wise. Oh, status-wise? At this time? No, Ephesus is it. So province of Asia right here, Ephesus is everything. Antioch is okay. Jerusalem's amazing because of what Jerusalem is with the temple and all of that. Philippi is a outpost for military leaders who retire and want to have status. So the status they had from their military years gets them cachet in Philippi, which is why Paul is giving his, uh, like when he talks about his own resume, because he's trying to match wits with them. And then he says, and it's all. Scubula, look it up. Rome, big, 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 big. But it's so far away. But Rome is like, what's the greatest city on earth with all the power in the world right now? Arlington. <laughs> That's Arlington right there. <laughs> uh, I don't know, because obviously, like... I, Wherever AI is originating. <laughs> no, but like, you're thinking of like... Like Caesars there. Yeah, D.C. Like, like military wealth, when they make decisions, it goes out. That's here. When they make religious decisions, they go out. That's there. Does that make sense? So, um, but Rome has its people everywhere. This is all Ro- This is all. Caesar was rolling around, just not marking messages with Cleopatra. That is exactly right. Caesar got around in many ways. All right. Why? Why does Paul write this letter to Timothy? So there's part of it that's pastoral. Hey, I want to give you some instructions. Think about what Timothy has already experienced at Ephesus. And now he's going to go back. Would you want a letter from your mentor? Yeah. Yeah. So that's part of it is, hey, there's some things I I want you to know. I want you to remember. I want you to hold fast to these things. Um. Hey, maybe you've never really planted a church on your own without me, so I want to give you some instructions on the kind of people you should put in charge. That's what we're going to get to in elders and widows and sort of that kind of stuff. But one of the big reasons I think Paul is also writing Timothy is because of this gal. This is Artemis. Now, what do you notice when you see this, especially in regard to color? 
What color is she? Yeah. What color are these things? Would you expect them to be black if they were breasts? Yeah, because she's, she's black on here and everything else is white. For the longest time, when people would dig up statues of Artemis, they either were one color or they had bad black and white photos and didn't know what color these were. So they mistook those as breasts. Now, <laughs> whatever. Those are clearly not breasts if you really look at them. However, uh, there was for a long time in uh, studies of ancient world, there's an obsession with sex. There just is. And um, so they said that she was the goddess of fertility. And those are breasts to represent she's very fertile. I don't know if anyone's had the birds and the bees talk with you. Breasts don't make you fertile. So no matter the size of your breast, it's not just around how many babies you can have. Also, these are animals all down here. And those are bees. Those are honeybees and animals. Those are animals. Most likely these represent like uh, the bulbousness of beehives or things like that, but she's covered in animals. She's actually the goddess of hunting and midwifery. When they finally started digging her up for real, for real, they realized, oh, this is not, and so they used to say, oh, at, in Ephesus there was just a sex cult. No, there wasn't at all. She was a lifelong virgin. She, she, that was part of her story. Like, she had wanted nothing to do with men. In fact, there's a story where a man came upon her in the woods while she was bathing and saw her naked, and she killed him immediately because no one has the right to see her naked body. She's truly an awful person. I know that I make jokes that I would have worshipped her, and I would have, <laughs> if not for Paul coming to the hall of Tyrannus. But she's awful. I'll give you one story that tells you just how awful she is. One of the beliefs is that she just walked around with, like, a renegade group of other virgin women. And you knew who they were because they kept their right breast uncovered. Yeah. One of them comes to her and says to her, I'm pregnant because I was sexually assaulted. And she says to her, you're unfit to follow me and kills the girl. That is not a God worth following. And in her mind, she let that happen to her. And that is a tale that we are still telling women today. And that is not a God worth following. Our God in Deuteronomy 22 says, if someone assaults you, they deserve death. There's a different level of respect for women. You would expect the woman to be team woman. She's awful. So we'll talk more about her next week because she's going to really impact the way that Paul talks about women and what's happening in the churches. But I want you to understand she dominates the landscape of Ephesus. This is their God, and they are so proud to have her. Like They are like, we are from Ephesus. We got Artemis. Her twin brother, Apollos, was born second, which will come up next week, because in our creation story, who's born first, man or woman? Man. Yeah, in their creation story, woman's born first. This is why Paul's going to say, no, man was born first, then woman. But he's number two. So they had, there's a city dedicated to Apollos, and they just look down on that city. They're like, you're just number two. It's like how OU feels about OSU at all times. <laughs> you will never be us. And I like to think they know that. Like, I'd like to think that the ancient city of Apollos understood. So, Artemis, we're going to talk about her next week. I'm going to tell you all about this woman. She's a psychopath. Um, but that's what this book is all about. Hopefully, we'll have these next week. She's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. But when Paul comes and establishes the church in Ephesus, people there, without a doubt, are worshiping Artemis. That's it. You would have had, in the ancient world, Jewish people and people who believed in the polytheistic religions of their place. And they have local gods, and they have big gods. Zeus is a big god. Then you have local gods. Artemis was local to Ephesus. That's their goddess. Now, is she goddess in other places? Absolutely. But they claim her locally because they have her temple. Okay? There are temples in the ancient world, and that's kind of where you know where this local stuff is. When people... So think about your own life. When you became a Christian, did you immediately drop all the vestiges of your own life? So if you were worshiping Artemis, do you think you're going to bring in some of that with you and some of those old beliefs? Yeah. That's a lot of why Paul is writing to Timothy, is to help him understand how do you minister in a place where Artemisian worship is so dominating the landscape and people are going to come in with some wonky, messed up views about how the world works, what women are supposed to be doing and not be doing, 
Um, like in Corinth, they are sleeping with everyone. They have what we call an over-realized eschatology. Paul comes to town and he goes, I have this amazing thing called grace. They're like, tell us more. And he's like, Jesus saves you from your sins. And they're like, that is awesome. So he leaves town and then he gets a report and they're like, hey, Paul, um, you said there's grace. So they said, we can do whatever we want. So now there's this guy sleeping with his mother-in-law and or his stepmother and and he's like, "Uh." And so he sends another letter and he's like, "Hey guys, that's not what I meant. Like I did not mean for that." So then in Corinthians, he's like, "Look, y'all, if you can stay single, you should stay single. Like d- don't get married. Just stay single so you can focus on the Lord and knock it off, but if you can't keep yourself from having sex, go ahead and get married. Like go ahead and get married, but otherwise stay single like me." Then you go to Ephesus, and he writes to the Ephesians, and he says to all the widows, what? Get married. And suddenly we're going, does the Bible contradict itself? No. In Corinth, they're sleeping with everything, and he's like, y'all need to learn chastity. What is wrong with you? In Ephesus, they're staying single because they love Artemis, and she's single. And they're like, we don't need to marry. And he's saying, you're staying single for the wrong reasons. Do you think Paul cares about singleness in the sense of one's better than the other? What does he care ultimately about? Conformity to what? Yeah. If you're conforming your life to Artemis and that's why you're staying single, we have a problem. So when people are like, Paul says it's better to be single. I'm like, he also says get married. So good luck with that. (laughs) All right. If you start studying Artemis and really study Artemis, suddenly some of the weirder parts of Timothy start to make a whole lot of sense. For example, you will be saved through childbearing if you believe in God. That verse in 1 Timothy 2 has been used and weaponized against women for so long and has been misunderstood. And then when you begin to understand that Artemis is the midwife or as the goddess of midwifery and she saves you through childbearing and suddenly Paul goes, no, God saves you through childbearing. Suddenly you think of this in completely different terms. It's not salvation. It's not any of that stuff. You're not women. You're not less than if you don't have a kid. He's saying don't trust in Artemis when you're laboring. Trust in God. Right? So suddenly all these things start to make a lot more sense if you study Artemis. So next week, I know that this is like, I've been teasing this book and all that. Next week, we're going to go do a deep dive into this. It's really fun. She's a sociopath. She's cool, though. That's the thing. I mean, like, she's like Wonder Woman, like the stories. And she's like, and you're like, yeah, oh, she killed a woman. Never mind, never mind, never mind. Um, Sandy, when she started really studying Artemis and writing on her about, like, She'd been studying her for 25 years in, um, excuse me, Dr. Glon, sorry, Dr. Glon. Uh, About 10 years ago, she really started writing on her. And so all these people go to Ephesus and bring back statues for her of Artemis. And one day she was like, I don't know why people do this. I hate her. I was like, oh, okay. I was like, you don't love her? And she's like, no, she she took people from Christ. Like she led people away from the one true God. I was like, oh, so you like actually love Jesus. Got it. Okay. I just thought. You just thought Artemis was cool. That's great. Um, not going to get you any more Artemis art. No, I'm kidding. I never did. I never got her art, but I would have. I know I would have, so I'm glad she told me that story. So, <laughs> all right. Get back in your groups, and you're going to ask and answer this question, and you've got, yeah, we've got time. Um, so really get in your groups. Uh, why do you think studying the background of any book of the Bible brings greater insight to that book? Hop in your groups, answer this question. Maybe even give an example of a time you studied a book and the background helped you understand a passage. All right, Ian, your group, what was something that you guys said? That doesn't mean Ian has to answer. I'm just giving his group a name as the one man in the group. Stacy's son's group. <laughs> Tashara didn't even hear the joke. I said Stacy's son's group. Would you give us an Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, that's good. He, he's, Paul knows, Timothy knows what he means. So he's not thinking someday in Dallas, Texas, we're going to be sitting in an old wax paper factory that's now turned into office spaces discussing this. And hopefully he's like, she's getting close. <laughs> hopefully. 
Alan's group, what's something you guys discuss? good it's really good yeah especially if you're not sure of your station in life right I mean I think so many times people don't realize how often God comes to rescue you so let me give you an example I went I mentored a girl who lived in Highland Park very 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 affluent family and she wanted me to take her to see the Hunger Games which I don't know anything about so I'm an hour into this and I'm like this is child abuse. Like, what am I watching? Not knowing it's a three-part series, and that is the point, that we shouldn't be having children murder each other. So I thought, that's pretty good. Didn't catch that in the first movie. So <laughs> you had to wait a while to get to that punchline. And so we leave there, and I'm like, Grace, what was this abomination? So we go to eat late night after the movie, and I'm like, Grace, what in the world? Um, and she says to me, you know, I want so badly to be like Katniss. And I said, Grace, honey, you would have been from the capital city or district one. Like, do you realize that's the influence you have? You're the girl who dies in the first 30 seconds from the bee bites. And I was like, she even looks like you, kiddo. And, uh, and she was like, she does. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, sorry, they wrote off your character. But, you know, there's this aspirational value of hers, which is good. I want to be like Katniss. Katniss is, you know, self-sacrificial and, and noble, right? So there's a goodness to that. But an unaware, and she was 16, but an unawareness of, hey, your station in life is such, there are people that live really hard lives and you live one of privilege. Um, and so when you're putting yourself in the story, sometimes people are like, I'm David, slaying Goliath. And I'm like, no, you're probably not David slaying Goliath. And so, but God is David slaying Goliath. If you want to be in the story, just make sure you put yourself in the right part of the story. And so, um, Alan, that's a really good point. Uh, Robin's group. We said something similarly about context, but like how growing up it was always talking about like, don't take one verse out of the cluster of verses that's around, but not at all like the background cultural yeah. context of like where it was, was written. And so then if you're a little girl growing up in the Bible Belt and it's saying, be silent, and you're like, but I'm really outspoken. <laughs> really good. There's an inconsistent hermeneutic to everyone. Um, I just wrote a paper for grad school about the evangelical hermeneutic of the plain reading of the text. But they don't actually follow that because one, you can't. I mean, I give the very example of like Corinthians and Ephesus. Do you tell a widow to remarry? Well, that's not what the Bible's supposed to be used for anyways. But in Corinthians, he's like, hey, remain silent. And three chapters earlier, he encourages women to pray and prophesy. But with their heads covered. So, ladies other than Christy and myself. <laughs> but my authority, head covering, told me I could take it off. And that's crap theology, you know what I'm saying? So this is, this is what I mean. It's like this is the problem of um, if you're not careful with the Bible, you will weaponize it. And um, it's supposed to impress upon you and show you more of who God is, not be a tool in your hand. So what about this front group, Stacy, Ian's mother's group? <laughs> <laughs> I talked about the geography just because it, it is critical. It, it, is it a coastal town? Do they back up to mountains? Are yeah. they on a plateau? Um, because that makes a difference in their safety and um, you know brings so much more information to the story as well. Yeah, it's really good. Really, really good. And metaphor, I mean, you, you know, uh, I, was, I spoke at a women's gathering yesterday, and one of the women started using a, a bunch of sports metaphors. And, and then she was like, I know, I know, we're a bunch of women in here. I don't know why I'm using sports metaphors. And I was like, well, I mean, Paul uses sports metaphors in um, Did It Land? And everybody's like, yeah, we knew exactly what she meant. And I was like, okay, yeah. So, like, that's the point is um, if I were to go teach 
in Maui. We plant St. Jude Maui. Can't wait. I don't know that I'd be using snow metaphors all the time, right? But then you hear of places that live in you know, the far north, and they're like, in their language, they have multiple words for snow depending on the type of snow it is, right? That's, that's, this matters. All of this stuff ultimately matters. And you're going to see this. Even in chapter 1, he talks about these two men. He says, they shipwreck their faith. That is not a metaphor I would use uh, in Dallas, yes. I mean, it's like, I realize now, it's kind of enough of a, you know, a parlance that you're kind of like, well, okay, we all kind of know what that means. But that, like, they, that was a real danger. I mean, that was, they understood what that meant. And so, um, okay, y'all get it. So let's jump into 1 Timothy 1. Uh, 1 Timothy 1 starts like most of any letters in the ancient world. Verses 1 and 2 are greetings and salutations, but the greetings for Paul, he often puts, um, he often puts words in his greetings that he's going to flesh out later, okay? And so then he does something interesting in ours, and we'll get to it. And then 3 through 7 are baddies teaching badly. 8 through 11 is the purpose of the law. 12 through 17 is Paul's story. Uh, and then 18 to 20 is a father to a son. And I put fight the good fight there. Uh, I don't know why I put that there. So... We'll jump into these. So, greetings and salutations. Again, the salutation in any ancient letter is very normal. You start with your name, me, and he usually says something about himself, and he usually makes a theological statement about God and the recipients. That's what Paul tends to do in his letters. But this one is odd in that he calls God soter in the Greek. So, in your translations, it probably says God our Savior. Is that what everybody has if you've got a Bible open in verse 1? Yeah, that is unique to the pastorals. Now, inscriptions. Anybody know what an inscription is? Yeah. Yeah, often carved in stone, things that are, you know, when you inscribe something, you write on it. Inscriptions in the ancient world are like public notifications of all kinds of stuff. So you would have inscriptions honoring the wealthy patron in the city because they dedicated this fountain or because they whatever. I mean, have y'all, like, you, we do it now. You walk by a bench in a park, and it's like in honor of, you know, whatever. Those, those are inscriptions. So there are inscriptions all over Ephesus that archaeologists have found, okay? 356 Greek and 23 Latin ones are dedicated to Artemis, okay? So, again, Artemis dominates the landscape. Isis is another, another goddess. She gets four inscriptions. Dionysus gets one. Zeus, who is her papa? He's the big guy. You want some move for you? You want Zeus. He gets one little piddly inscription in Ephesus. They're like, we don't care about Zeus. We got his daughter. We got all we need here. Apollo, her brother. <laughs> I can't even believe there is one. Like, I'm surprised they even mentioned his name. I'm sure it's in conjunction with her, and I will go find out what it says. In some of these inscriptions, they call Artemis Soter. They call her the Soter. She's the Savior. So Paul doesn't call God Soter in any of his other letters. But when he's writing to Timothy, he's like, no, 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 no. Artemis is not Soter. She is not Savior. God is Soter. This is polemic. This is polemical language. It's the same thing when people say Jesus is Lord. Because normally they say Caesar is Lord. And they're saying, nah. Uh uh-uh. Caesar, who gets around in more than one way, he is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. And so what Paul is doing here is the same thing as he's using this soter, which is odd to Paul. So going back to thinking about people going, that's odd language that Paul is using. Well, not if you're writing to people who think Artemis is soter. So he starts off and he says, God is soter. And then like we did at the beginning, we talks about, he talks about, uh, what was it, grace, mercy, and peace. Those are very, grace and, uh, grace and peace, like Charis and Irene, those are like, pretty normal just language in the ancient world that you would write to each other, but Paul means something different, so he's always co-opting language around him. Even like the word the gospel, like that's just normal good news. That's just like a heralding of good news. Like you'd be like, the gospel of Caesar, we all get bread this month. Well, the Christian uh, culture often co-opted from from the outside world and said, nope, this is ours now. And they did a pretty good job because we still use those terms. Then he tried, and then he gets right into his letter. Now, Normally, y'all have read Paul. Have y'all read Ephesians? And he has, uh, if you ever translate Ephesians in Greek, Paul does not take a breath. It's one giant sentence in the beginning that's like, and God is immeasurable. And like the joke that people always do is like, they go translate to the end of the sentence. And then you realize, oh my gosh, it's 12 verses. (laughs) Paul doesn't do that here. 
He's not, and again, it's not a communal letter, so that could explain it, but also he just jumps right in. He just kicks in the door with First Timothy and Titus. He's just like, let's just get down to the brass tacks. And the thing that he's worried about is false teachers popping up and being obsessed with myths and endless genealogies is what he says. Now, this myth and endless genealogies is why for years scholars have thought he's talking about false Jewish teachers coming in and infiltrating the church with the Old Testament genealogies and myths. That might be what's happening. But the other piece that it might be is there might be something tied to myths and genealogies to Artemis, that they're trying to trace Artemis's family line through Zeus and all the way up. So you kind of have these two things. But either way, what he is concerned about is they're taking the Torah and teaching it badly. He's saying they're taking the law and they're not using it the way that they're supposed to. And so he is very concerned this is what these false teachers have come into town to do. And this is why he's saying, hey, Paul, you, or hey, Timothy, you have to go in there and you have to teach soundly to them. You, you've got to make sure they understand what the actual gospel truth is. And then he says one of the most profound statements, I think, in all of Paul's writing. And he says, look, they're obsessed with myths and endless genealogies, but not you. The goal of our instruction is supposed to be love. That's the goal of our instruction, is love. That comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. This is why we start every class the same way. How do we start every class? What's the goal of all Christian instruction? Yeah, worship is ultimately loving the Lord. And hopefully you guys are doing it from a pure heart, a good conscience, your faith. Who didn't? I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but this is what he's saying. Hey, he's saying, hey, look, the goal is not to come in and with your teaching, razzle-dazzle people with endless genealogies and all this stuff. The goal when we teach people is to become better lovers. Where else have you heard this? In the Bible. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you guys got, <laughs> it's not a trick question, you know, you can say it with your chest. <laughs> Corinthians, yeah, where else have we heard this before, right? What does he say about, like, if you do this without love, you are a clanging symbol, right? Where else have we learned that the goal of instruction is love? Or whose ideas are these? That the hope of teaching is to generate love. Where did they get this idea? Very good. Very good. Where else is the Shema then repeated? Like there you go. Martha knows. <laughs> Martha's a good student. Yeah, this whole idea. Paul's not coming up with something new here. right? He's saying, look, the goal of all that we're doing, these false teachers, part of the problem is not just because they're teaching weird myths. The problem is they don't understand the point of all of this, which is to create love in you. Pure love, good love, not just in love for the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then Leviticus 19, 18, who else? Your neighbor, right? You can sum up the whole law in what two commands? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And your second is love your neighbor as yourself. Boom. That's Paul's point here. Hey, this is the problem. Is these teachers are not creating better worshipers of God and lovers of neighbor. Now, the pure heart, good conscience, and sincere faith, those are virtues. Paul is writing in a Greco-Roman context where vice and virtue are going to be contrasted. And so he knows that he's picking up on these ideas of like, this is what it means to be a person of virtue. Um, so love is all over the Bible, and good conscience is the ability to discern truth. That's what he's getting at there. If you have a good conscience, you can discern that. Uh, discern truth, morality, and thus guide a person towards virtue. Okay, so the idea of a good conscience is like, you know what a good way of living looks like. Sincere is the translation of unhypocritical. So he's taking aim at the false teachers, right? He's saying like, look, the goal of instruction is to be sincere in your faith, not a hypocrite. And that's what the false teachers are. And so he knows what he's doing by saying these things. And so then he goes on, he says, hey, look, they're taking the law and they're distorting it, but they don't even know what the law is for. And so in verses 8 through 11, he says, this is the purpose of the law. He's like, you don't even know what it's good for. Absolutely. No. I'm just kidding. It's not absolutely nothing. He says the law is good. The law helps you reveal sin. And if you understand that, if you understand what the law is doing, then you understand that the law is good. Because people go, oh, the law is just there to reveal that I'm a sinner. And he's like, that is good that the law is able to do that. 
but it's only good if you use it legitimately. Do we not experience that? How many times has the law been used at you rather than for you and with you, right? You can weaponize the law if you're not careful. And so he's saying, look, the law is only useful if you use it legitimately and it's with a Christology in mind. Christ comes to fulfill the law. So if your use of the law does not include Christ, you do not understand the law at all, and therefore you shouldn't be teaching it. So if you come in and you're just like, this is what the Bible means, and it has nothing of love and nothing of Christ, you don't know what the Bible means. I don't care how good you are at it. You're wrong. And then he goes on, he talks about a long list of sinners or vices. So in the first part, he's like, this is what a virtuous person looks like, and then he says, this is what a sinner looks like. So he's basically saying to to Timothy, teach people to be loving, moral, and sincere. Don't be, and he picks like crazy lists here. He's like, people that murder their dad and mom. How many of those are they worried about? I just am so, like, uh, and then he uses adulterers, people that solicit prostitutes, slave traders, liars, perjurers. Okay, yeah, so stay away from that. Now, One of the things I want to note here, in this list, there are uh, people that use Paul as if it's a checklist, as if to say, um, people are going to do this later when he talks about qualifications for elders, and they're like, here's the checklist. Does he have this? Does he have this? Does he have this? Paul is not intending for us to do this with these vice and virtue lists. He's trying to say, this is what a person of virtue looks like. And this is what a person of vice looks like. Within this list is a word that can mean uh, male homosexuality, or it can mean men who bed boys. And that's the difficulty of this word. And when people can on that one word, and they make this the list of what is a good or bad person, they have misunderstood Paul and misunderstood what he's doing with this text. And so we'll talk about that later, but what he's trying to say to Timothy is he's not trying to say, these are the worst sins. I mean, he puts lying in there. Like, everyone knows, I would rather you lie to your mom than kill her. (laughs) So he'll be like, these are the worst sins. No, they're not. What he's doing is he's creating a portrait of what people of virtue look like versus people of non-virtue, but people of vice. And so when people key in on some of these verses, you have to be careful in the way that you weaponize them. And so you guys are tracking with me. All right. So he says this is the purpose of the law. And then what's interesting is Paul then tells his story. And his story is like this. I was the worst. He starts listing his vices. He was a blasphemer. He murdered people. Right? Which is worse than lying. But then he's also an arrogant man. And he's saying, look, guys, I am just like that, except for what happened to me. He met Christ. And then he goes on and he says, these are the kinds of people that God saves. So you want to take this vice list and weaponize it and say, oh, these are bad people. And he's saying, no, 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 we're all bad people. (laughs) If not, for what? Yeah, the grace of God. So if you really are belonging to God, so he's, again, he's taking aim at false teachers. Hey, false teachers, if you really are one of us, then you're going to be transformed by the work of the gospel in your life and desire to be a person of virtue, not someone who continues to play with the old tools of empire before you were a Christian. That's what he's getting at. And for 2,000 years, some people have taken these things and beaten up the outsiders when Paul's saying, no, we've all been outsiders but for the grace of God. But don't say I'm an insider and then do outsider stuff and think you can get away with it. That's what he's taking issue with. So he's just saying, look, this is the kind of salvation that God is bringing to people is he saves sinners. In fact, it's the only kind of people he's ever saved. Did y'all know that? It's crazy. (laughs) And then, because Paul is Paul, he breaks out into song. It's why Paul's crazy. Like, this is so funny. He's like, in verse 15, this is a trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance statement. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. That's it. That's the only kind of people he saves. Cool. And I am the worst of them. People want to take Paul's list just above that and beat people with him. Paul's like, you took your eye off the ball. I already told you I'm the worst. You need an example of a bad person? I'm I'm right here. This is why he doesn't want you picking on people. I'm the worst of them. But Christ saved me so that he can demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those 
who would believe in him for eternal life. And then all of a sudden he just breaks out into rap. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. It's like in the middle of it, he's just like, oh, and by the way, God's amazing. Which is very Paul, which is why people are like, it doesn't sound like Paul. I'm like, who else, you know, breaks out and rap in the middle of their theological treatise? Now, it's a very Jewish doxology. King eternal, this is Old Testament language, right? Immortal, the only forever, invisible, and then he's throwing shade. Why do you think he says the only God? Because she's not so tear. No, 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 there's only one God under heaven and earth. Yeah, he's throwing shade. And to that one God is glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. And all God's people said, amen. Yeah. And then he keeps going because it's Paul. So even after he like breaks out into rap, he says, amen. His sermon's not over, so we've got to press on. So we've got two more verses. So then he says, hey, Tim. He's writing to Tim. He says, Tim, my son very sweet. I am giving you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you so that by recalling them, you may fight the good fight, having faith and a good conscience. Timothy, you're the kind of guy who has faith and a good conscience. He's got virtue, which some have rejected and uh, which the, the faith and good conscience, some people have rejected that and shipwrecked the faith. And among them, and he names them, that's wild. We would never do that today or you'd get sued for libel. But among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered to Satan, so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. There's our shipwreck language, which people on the coast would understand. Paul loves familial language, and he means it. When, yes? What do you think he meant there by being taught not to blaspheme? Um, I think that it's similar to the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, this idea of giving credit to God's enemies for God, or vice versa, um, or speaking about, because Paul is still very Jewish, so I think attributing anything unholy or sinful to God would also fall in that category for him. So it's interesting because um, at other times, Paul uses this hand over to Satan language at other times, and uh, it's a weird phrase that people have used to also, like, really, really harm people. Like, Satan's going to get you. And I'm like, whoa, okay, ease up. Um, because the hope is always restoration. I mean, we see that in Matthew 18. And so this blaspheme language, I think probably because they're being named, they would have had to have been significant. I don't think he names people that are just kind of like hanging out with the Ephesians and decide, you know, this isn't for me. So my guess is they probably taught something about God that was not in keeping with the gospel. And he calls that blasphemy would be my, my guess. Um, yeah, that's a good question. But Paul loves familial language, and he means it. So when he's like, you're my brother, you're my sister, treat each other like brothers, he's not messing around. And, fam and the reason why is family in the ancient world is not just, like, uh, affection, it's allegiance. Like your family is your highest allegiance. So he's trying to reorient allegiance. Um, but it's also endearment. So it is not endearment, but it is also allegiance to that. And so there's something really tender about him calling him his son. Uh, it's this like sage, mentor, family relationship. And to the best that we know, we don't know that Paul had any children. And so, um, and to be, to be a Jewish man with no sons uh, is odd, if not shameful. And so this is a, it's a sweet thing that we're seeing between Paul and Timothy. And then he says to him, fight the good fight which is military language. He's borrowing military language here. Why do you think he's saying this to Timothy? And going back to Acts 19 and that crazy story I told you, why do you think he's telling Timothy you need to fight the good fight? Do you think he wants him to beat up Ephesians? No. Right? Because if why would you want that if the goal of instruction is love? Why is he using military language, though? Yeah, yeah. I think he's telling Tim, hey man, you're in for a battle here. And the last time they were in this area, like everyone else was fighting against them. So yeah. Like, yeah. Fight different. <laughs> well, and in war, sometimes you win battle and then you lose one and then you retake the hill. Yeah. And so it's going to be. Yeah, and you're in it for the long haul. Well. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of like gird your loins, get ready. I mean, you know, 
I didn't have a dad growing up, but I've seen enough TV to know what they typically do. So, um, <laughs> you know, you see that scene, right? Like, or I mean, you can moms do. My mom did this to me. It doesn't have to be a dad, but this idea, like, I remember, like, you got this. Like, you can do this. You're tough. Like, you know, put your big girl panties on. Let's go. Like that phrase, put your big girl panties on. In some context, you're like, ugh. But when your mom or your dad is like, look, we got this, right? There's something really sweet to that. And there's something uh, honest about that. Tim, I know what I've sent you to do, bud. And it's, it's going to be hard. Don't give up. Fight good, too. I mean, don't fight dirty. Yeah, a thousand percent. And you see this. This is, my, this is my main problem with Christianity Today, not the magazine, American Christianity Today, who co-ops military language from the Bible and then co-ops weapons of evil. You, you do not, the early church, re, they were crucified. They didn't fight back. Pa, Paul is constantly being beaten. and He's a Roman citizen. He has the right to say, don't put your hands on me. And he has the right to retaliate when they do. Like he's giving up his man card over and over again to turn the other cheek. Where do you think he learned that from? I mean, Jesus is about to be arrested, and Peter, who we are always like, ah, oh, Peter. And I'm like, Peter shows a lot of courage to take on Rome in that moment. And he's like, I will fight to the death for you. And he's like, Pete, I know you will, but that's not how we fight our battles. And he's like, put your sword away, Pete. And, and Pete is like, okay, I don't know what any of this means. And then later he's crucified upside down because he knows what it means. Because the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon him and he goes, ooh, that's how we fight our battles. And so we, our weapons are not elections. Our enemies are not our literal physical neighbors who vote differently. Like the, the language of the Bible where it uses that we're going to talk about that in the so what. This is, it drives me bananas when people take the violent or, or military rhetoric and don't even understand what's happening here. Tim is not jacked Jesus fighter in Ephesus fighting battles. He's preaching the Bible and probably very unpopular in the city. But he's got a good conscience, unlike these two. So there's our shipwreck metaphor. And this hand over to Satan is such a strong phrase, but probably what they have in mind is Matthew 18. This idea of like, you confront, you confront, you confront, and if nothing changes, and they say, okay, treat them like a non-believer. That's, that's what they mean. Well, how do you treat non-believers? Hopefully. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hopefully with great love and endearment and kindness. Now, do you have boundaries? Of course you do. Is this applying to abuse and things of that? No, no, of course not. But I don't think it would be out of line for Timothy to call up Alexander and say, let's get coffee, which they didn't do. But whatever the equivalent, what are you doing, man? We need you back in the good fight. What are you doing? That's not the gospel. And we don't know how it turned out. All right, we're going to skip the discussion because it is time. So we're going to move straight to the so what. So what? Uh, big so what. God saves. That's one of the big so what's of these letters. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. That is a saying that is trustworthy and full of acceptance. You want to tattoo a Bible verse on your body and you don't know which one? That's a pretty good one. Just right there. Christ Jesus came to save sinners. What kind of people does Christ Jesus save? There's only one kind. Sinners. Which means you've got to be honest about who you were and what you're capable of. The only people Jesus saves are sinners. Which is great. I came in the world to save the sick. And people are like, oh, I don't need that. He's like, yeah, you do. It's the only kind of people I've ever saved. Vice and virtue lists sometimes get more attention than what is necessary. This is the kind of person that Paul is saying is especially bad. No, it's not what he's saying. Or they get no attention at all. And that is not good either. The gospel transforms you. If you today are the same person 20 years from now, and you're like, hey, I intellectually assented to an idea that Jesus died and rose again three days later, but I absolutely want nothing to do with Christ until the day where I die and I get to go to heaven. You have misunderstood the gospel. The gospel is power, and it has the power to change you, and it has the power to grow you and to transform you into a person of virtue. Hopefully you are more loving as time goes on with the Lord. 
you're going to mess up. You're going to fall back. You're going to slide back. I'm not saying that there is a, a perfection you're going to attain. What I'm saying is, though, is the gospel is powerful to change you, to be the kind of person that was in that vice list, like Paul, arrogant, persecutor, to a man who says the goal of all instruction. Uh, that, yeah. Okay, back to what you were saying, Karen, about the good fight. We hear fight, hand over Satan, unholy and irreverent, and we think battle lines, us versus them, we're the good people, you're the bad people, and we forget that Paul's already told us, no, 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 no. The goal of instruction is love. If, and this is, I mean, y'all, if we leave here in six weeks, and you think you're better than your neighbor, I have failed you. If, if we leave here in six weeks and you think there's a pecking order of sinners, I have failed you, right? Th- this language of fighting him over Satan, this is contextualized language, but Tim's not picking up weapons other than the Holy Spirit, right? You've got that language of like the, the breastplate, of, breastplate of righteousness, right? It's sort of this sword of the Bible, but it's not meant to beat people with it. Right? It's meant to withstand the arrows of the enemy and to put you in a place where you can go and get the prisoners of war and bring them away from the enemy into a place of love and rescue. This, this violent language that the church has co-opted for the gospel is unholy in every way, and we should not participate in it. Um, and so my encouragement to you all is just be careful with metaphors. I know I just picked on Watermark earlier, but there was a metaphor they used all the time where they'd say, Christianity is not a cruise ship, it's a battleship. And I'm like, no, it's a mercy envoy ship that shows up with supplies and doctors and therapists and help. And, and that's what we are. And so I just make sure that the goal of all of your Christian instruction is worship, not, not fighting and make sure the content of that teaching is always the gospel because the gospel is good news and Jesus came to save sinners. All right, next week, 1 Timothy 2, and we're going to do a deep dive into Artemis and we'll jump into those weird old passages. Any questions? I know I'm over on time, but any questions for tonight? Martha, will you pray us out of here? Amen. Love you guys. We'll see y'all next week. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure.